Good evening, everyone. I'm Mark Anderson. I'm the Director of Education here at Domus Academy. Welcome uh, to this event this evening. It's been organized with the Milan chapter of the Speculative Futures, an international meetup community that focuses on speculative and critical design. A special thanks to Silvio Choni for his help in organizing this. Thank you, Silvio. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Julian Bleeker from the Future Lab Near Future Laboratory. Julian's a creative leader and engineer with multiple degrees in product design. Uh, uh, he's a thought-provoking leader, innovator, concentrates on, uh, on futures, and he runs and, innovate, and has run innovative workshops with important organizations and groups such as IKEA, Apple, Google, and Facebook, among many others. Throughout his career, he has experiences as a startup founder, future strategist, professor, design, and technology mentor and author. Welcome, welcome, Julian. Thank you. This evening with uh, Julian, uh, we have a, a very special guest, Gabriel Ferri, who is a design research and assistant professor the, at the Department of Industrial Design and Systemic Change uh, at Eindhoven University of Technology. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you both for being with us this evening. Uh, the format uh, this evening will, is going to be fairly informal. Uh, uh, Gabriel will be in conversation with Julian, uh, and that will last for about 20 to 30 minutes. And then we'll have space for questions from some of our students and some of the public. So welcome. Thank you for everyone for joining us. And I pass, pass the stage to Julian Gabriel. Thanks, Mark. It's really a pleasure being here virtually uh, with all of you. Um, I'm going to start by apologizing with my voice, uh, for my voice. Um, I'm coming out of a really annoying cold, but I hope that uh, I am understandable uh, uh, in addition to my usual Italian accent. Um, Julian, it's really, truly a pleasure having you as a, as a guest in, uh, in this conversation. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a question that is rather introductory, uh, because I assume that uh, in the audience there are people that are not super familiar with design fiction and with uh, mm. speculative design and all the concepts that are uh, in that orbit. So um, I guess that uh, you find yourself relatively often in the position of having to explain what you what, what do you do to to a potential client or to a potential cooperate or to somebody. Uh, you, have, you, you have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So um, just for the just for the for the for the context, give us the 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 quick version that you usually use uh, in those scenarios. Yeah, so the quick version is to say that uh, design fiction is a way of creating uh, tangible artifacts from a possible future in order to help activate the imagination and uh, give a bit more context to a particular project or brief. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I often liken like design fiction to a way of constructing the, the sensibility and the, the kind of the, the cultural milieu of a, of a project through the creation of essentially like props. So mm -hmm. one way to think of it is, is the, the way in which a production designer will create the mise-en-scene for a film. They're trying to create a, a richer sense of where we are uh, and and the, the nature of the world and the context of the world that is, to a certain degree, external to the, the script itself. So the, 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 the bringing the world to life, that sense that you, that you get when uh, a really well-done production is des design is done for a stage play, which is dramatically different from just uh, reading the play. That's what design fiction does. It, it brings a, a richer sense of the feeling of the world. Um, and another way to look at it that I often find helpful is to use uh, what I refer to now as the, the archaeology analogy, which is if we think of what archaeologists do, they, they dig into the past, like they unearth these fragments, these, these symptoms, these, this evidence of a world. And it might be just a settlement, it might be a home, it might be an entire civilization, but they try to construct the world through the collection of these artifacts with no other way really to know the world. There's no one still living. Uh, all the records have, have disintegrated. 
Um, and all, so all you get is these kind of almost like forensic evidence. And archaeologists that are really effective at their job are able to tell a story about the world from just maybe this little fragment, from some little scrap that they found, uh, as opposed to telling the story of the world from the top down. They're almost literally going from the bottom up, the things that they find around where someone might have been cooking or yeah. where there was maybe a battle fought. And they try to construct it. And the ones who do it really well, they tell these like fantastic stories about it. You know, they, oftentimes they become the presenter on the public television show where they're like, and that's where they ate their food. And, and they get this richness to it where you can kind of feel into the world. That is the opposite of the highly analytic description of a world. Uh, the one that just sort of says what the population was, uh, what their likely trade routes were, uh, what their the the economy was, what the religion was. It's not just kind of written out in a Wikipedia style. This is the one where you can actually immerse mm -hmm. yourself into it. And the design fiction does that level of immersion. And it often works in concert with other ways of kind of feeling into a possible future world, which is those kind of analytic methods. So people look at trends lines. They might look at, uh, you know, particular kinds of um, uh, directionality of, of an industry. Uh, they might be looking at some kind of um, research that's being done that feels like it's sort of part of a future world. And they might sort of make declarative statements. In the future, everyone will be in autonomous vehicles. You might be like, yeah. okay, well, maybe, but I don't get it. What does that world feel like? Yeah, but what, what uh, is the experience of it? But yeah, but allow me to role play a little bit here the Please. You know, possible sure. client or possible cooperator. Uh, you, you say a couple of times possible futures, but I mean, how how do we know uh, if this is likely or unlikely? How do you generate these possibilities? Yeah, well, so first of all, you have to get over the thing of like expecting to know, because we, we know as reasonable people that there is no way to know for certainty what the future will be. There are some people who, who are such um, powerful and effective dreamers that they can make us believe that that is what the world will be and they often have the uh industrial uh capability and the resources to bring those things t into existence mm -hmm. um whether or not they will be successful is always is always sort of up for um you know the world will, will remind them or tell them that this thing is is what we want or not what we want so we don't know and design fiction is very specifically not about predicting uh, it's about uh, getting a sense of what a world might be like uh, mm -hmm. in order to help in, inform and shape and sort of guide decision making that that is almost specifically not the kind of evidence based decision making. So it's not 89 percent certainty that we're going to be, you know, we're going to live in a world with uh, with with exclusively plant based protein. You yeah. don't say that. We say, hmm. It's interesting. Your so your line of business is plant based protein. I wonder what that world would be like. Why don't we kind of why don't we create some of the some of the context around that world? Why don't we do a make some make some other plant based products as speculative uh, exemplars and see what they do to us? See how they make us feel. Think see the way in which they inspire conversations or maybe even generate new kinds of ideas. Yeah, um, th this is quite interesting, but. Um... You just mentioned plant-based products and you know a possible consultancy in that in that direction. And do you find yourself in the position of offering some kind of ethical uh, judgment on whether something that you uh, explore is desirable or not? Or in your practice, is, is it something that uh, you just present and then you let your client decide uh, what what will be for them? Yeah, that's a that's a really tough question because I I don't think it's it's really quite possible to extract uh, ethics from any knowledge production. So ethics always sort of precedes that to a certain degree. Um, it's never been a challenge uh, to find the way to kind of represent the complexity of of you know ethics or or, or sensibilities around values within the design fiction because it's design fiction doesn't really take. I mean it it's I'm now I'm talking about design fiction like it's just a thing that operates on its own but when I do design fiction uh I, I I'm seeing multiple points of view and perspectives on the world so 
if I'm going to do, uh, let's say for a, for a project, I decide that, um, a good design fiction artifact to help us in, help inspire conversations on a, on a specific topic is a magazine from the future. We're going to use a magazine from the future. Um, as if we got into the near future laboratories, proprietary, um, not very well functioning time travel machine, went into this future world, uh, wound up, uh, in front of a, of a newsstand jumped out of the machine real quick, grabbed a couple of magazines, jumped back in the machine and came back to the present. Okay, what are these magazines that we brought back? And let's say one is like a general news magazine. And we know in general news magazines, uh, oftentimes uh, commercial um, you know, companies will have advertisements in it to kind of represent their business. So let's say it's The Economist. We brought back The Economist magazine from the future. Uh, there are ways in which you can represent certain aspects of 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 the world in in uh, in in ways that gives you a chance to speak to multiple, I guess, which you might say is like ethical points of view or opinions about the future. One is an advertisement from a company that does plant based protein, and in that you're going to celebrate all its wonderful potential and possibilities. Or you're going to have an advertisement for the introduction of a new a new line of plant based protein. And at the same time, you can have an editorial article that's that uh, looks at another angle of what plant-based protein might mm -hmm. bring to the world. And another thing, you could have a uh, an alternative company that's like, "Hey, come to Mon do you miss animal-based protein? Mm -hmm. Come to our Montana ranch. We have exclusive resort, you know, exclusive uh, week-long stays where we eat nothing but fresh, you know, fresh-caught bison." Yeah. And so you can you can you can bring a bunch of different angles to the project and represent it in a way that feels uh, I, what I would say is like more complete than just taking one particular perspective. And that in that way, you are in that in that capsule of that magazine, you're having multiple conversations that hopefully when you know, when when introduced to the client allows them to wonder in ways that they're probably wondering anyway, but they know because their line of business is just mm -hmm. plant based protein, they shouldn't say anything sort of like out loud about the bad sides of it. Yeah. But through this magazine, they can begin to have those conversations and debates and use that to inform what they think about what they're doing and how they're doing it and how they want to represent it and all those kinds of things. Yeah. Something that I really appreciate about uh, the way you conduct design fiction is actually the openness to, to a plurality of point of views, like, like mm -hmm. you just like you just explained, and also the idea of um, uh, concepts and opinions and point of view that are emerging from material that is there and is not necessarily presented in a info dump on the on the on the client. So I really I really appreciate the explanation that you just uh, that you just gave. But I really have to wonder if you don't find it somehow. Uh, a bit frustrating or somehow a little bit restrictive that uh, you are just laying uh, options on the table for somebody to choose and you don't really get to take a political uh, stance. Were, were you ever tempted to, to, to be a little more overt in, in your uh, way of presenting what could be preferable or not? <laughs> not really. I mean, I, I find it actually quite refreshing to be able to not have a uh, you know, have mul have multiple opinions simultaneously. It's really it's really hard position to kind of hold in a way. And I think it's it's you know just for me it's uh, me personally it's uh, it's a challenge to be um, both an engineer who loves building stuff no matter what or creating things, and also being like kind of overeducated to know very quickly and easily how um, how much I enjoy the the critique. The being able to be, you know, kind of be contrarian to even the whole point of view that I might hold, like always saying like, well, wait, what? what, what about this? And what about this? What about this perspective? And wouldn't it be cool if, and then also be like, but you know, that might actually be kind of difficult. Like, what would that world be like? So though, so, you know, take the autonomous vehicles, for example, like I find it absolutely fascinating. I mean, just from a technical standpoint and at this exact same time, I'm like, uh, that is a weird, crazy world. If if we live in a world with like uh, uh, you know ubiquitous aut uh, autonomous not just vehicles but maybe just like everything, and trying to imagine into that world um, at the same time as I'm as I'm able to 
wonder in a, you know feel feel like a certain sense of awe at the possibility at the same time i'm i'm seeing all the all the complexity and all the challenges and i and i and, and holding those two points of view together at the same time i find to be uh sort of exciting almost like you know your 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 mind is going at a particular pace and you're seeing lots of different optionalities and possibilities uh and so it's not really i don't feel necessarily a I'm in the, I'm the one to say what should or shouldn't be. I'm the one to offer like, here's the whole landscape. Here's everything that I see about this. And in, in the conversation with, you know, with a client or a decision maker or whoever it might be to engage in that, like just go into that world and yeah. point at different things. Like, look how that, that looks like really cool, but like that thing looks a little bit weird. I'm not sure about what a world would be like that. Or say, have you thought about this? Like the complexity of all these uh, second or third order implications of what that world might contain and how that would exist. And 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 so I, I find that actually quite invigorating. Yeah, I absolutely get it. Thanks for this. Um, look, I would like to shift gear a little bit mm -hmm. uh, because we we do have time for conversation, but not so much. So there are a, a few topics that I really would like to to cover. Um, in my own practice, when I, I'm a teacher mostly, and uh, occasionally uh, I make games that are about possible futures, but mm. when I teach and when I have to teach the basics of speculation and design fiction and all the different traditions that are connected to, to this, um, I find it particularly complicated to just let the student take the first step. Uh, mm. because. There is often this sense of paralysis, uh, as in, oh my God, I need to envision this just enormous scenario. And I keep repeating, no, you're not envisioning a world, you are envisioning a small artifact. And from mm -hmm. that, you start uh, with the world. But uh, I still find this uh, maybe the biggest challenge to just let the students go and be, and be creative. What advice would you give to uh, a student that is uh, tackling design fiction for the first time in their life? <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, each particular case is unique, of course. I, I think the, one of the challenges that I've noticed is the, um, I don't want to generalize, but it feels like the our ability to imagine has been somewhat has atrophied i feel like that the the ability to imagine a world through as you you know through a pencil is uh well i think it's hard and being able to kind of luxuriate in that and not expect a an answer to something as opposed to uh just the edge of a world is a really hard thing to do. And I think that comes from having a very active imagination um, and looking for the kind of tangential approaches. So I think that's a, that's a skill that's developed and it comes with really doing, you know, like think of the imagination as like a muscle, like mm -hmm. doing exercises, like what is CrossFit for the imagination? So I think about that. And so I think about, you know, what are ways in which you can do like daily exercises uh, to obtain that kind of, you know, that active, really uh, invigorated, nicely bulked up brain muscle that allows you to see into worlds and feel into worlds in a in a really active way. And so, I think one one approach is, you know, if, if it's a specific project, then I don't know, you just got to get to it. But I think one thing is to, you know, literally do like a, like daily design fictions, like every morning, say I'm gonna, you know you brought the pencil example, which is a beautiful one, because we all know it. And we all sort of, to a certain degree, take it for granted. You know, we don't, mm -hmm. there's nothing really special about it. But it's like, every morning, do a pencil from a different world, for yeah. example. And what is what is engraved on it? Does it say, does it still say Eberhard Faber? Um, what is it? What is its shape? What are the things that it's drawing? And just and just and just try that and push against that sense of like, well, I don't get it. A pencil is just a pencil. Like, how could I do a different one every day for a month? But yeah. I think, and it's through that exercise. It's like it's like looking at 
you know, whatever you do, if you, if you lift weights or kettlebells or go for a run, it's like you keep doing it because you know that there's going to be an achieved result at the end. It's going to become easier. You're going to become more comfortable than that. You're going to enjoy it more. You're going to have to feel a sense of like, okay, I feel myself getting better at this, but you have to do it. You can't just stare at the thing and shrug and walk away. So I like this idea of just doing it um, as an exercise, not just waiting for the brief to come. We have a class assignment or an assignment from a client. Mm-hmm. Like every day, think of, let me, and then, you know, and one of the exercises for the pencil could be like, I'm going to make an advertisement for the mm-hmm. pencil. Yes. I'm going to write an editorial story about the print pencil. I'm going to um, make a coupon for get, get one, buy one pencil, get two, get, uh, get two. I'm going to do yeah. a, um, a, uh, uh, a deal where it's like you buy a coffee and you get a pencil. Like, what is that? How can you represent that and not just say that? So there's a bunch of ideas, but actually go through the trouble of constructing it, doing the, creating the advertisement, not just saying like, oh, I can imagine an advertisement. Yeah. Like, is it for a sandwich shop and a pencil? Is it for a, you know, yeah. a donut and a pencil? <laughs> or alternatively, all... you need a mortgage to get a pencil. You need a yes. permit to get a pencil. Uh, yeah. You will be fined if you are found with the pencil and things like right. this. Yeah, all that, those, that's... all those things, you just kind of run it down. And that's why, I mean, you know, I'm just, so we make this work kit yep. that 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 provides that you know it's meant to be that it's I think it literally I put it on the side of it that's on the inside a gymnasium and a court cardboard box useful for bulking up your imagination muscle. It's... <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's really fitting. But uh, w- what I really like about this uh, this answer is the idea that imagination and in, as a consequence, design fiction is also a practice. Uh, mm-hmm. And I would like to segue this asking you uh, how did your practice evolved in the in the last decade i guess because you've been doing this for uh, for some time uh, already so do you see a change in the way you yourself are working yeah that's a big question i definitely do i, I definitely and do. we have I, only five minutes for this <laughs> yeah I, I definitely do i feel like there was there there was um there was a sense of uh, instinct around this practice that I had to get on paper and I described it as design fiction. And, and you know, there's, there's a whole uh, you know, story about the collaborations that I did to kind of get to that point. And um, I, I, I had trouble finding the way to represent its value as a, uh, as a service, you know, like as a commercial service. And then I got distracted because I started a company and I, you know, ran the company. And then uh, eight years later, I, I, I sold the company. And so then I was like thinking, okay, let me get back to this design fiction stuff. And something had changed in the world. And that thing that had changed is that it, it, it seemed like there was more resonance around this practice, whether it's design fiction or, you know, whatever you want to call it, speculative design, doing design that was bringing imagination to, to structure in these very interesting, unique ways that were not just purely utilitarian design, like industrial design or graphic design. It was very much meant to activate and, and, and contribute to discussions and debates about what could be. And that, that had changed. It was not that way when I, you know, quote unquote, started like 2008, 2009. It was very much uh, more academic, if anything. Mm-hmm. And, and now I feel like it's leaked into the world uh, more broadly. And I think that I, I, I'm guessing that that is because those students who are studying it sort of brought it into their, their, their kind of professional commercial life and said, I think this is a thing. I think we need to integrate this into our design practice more generally. Our design practice should not just be purely based on what design research tells us, or it shouldn't just be based on like design thinking. It needs a little bit more imagination and speculation, and uh, and and we need to br- find a way to bring feeling into the discussion about the kinds of products or services that we create alongside of the spreadsheets and the bar graphs and the pie charts. Yeah, definitely. But I'm really struck by the fact that you say that recently there has been more resonance towards Mm -hmm. uh, design fiction. That's a really encouraging way of putting that, but Mm -hmm. uh, for once allow me to take the contrarian part and maybe it could also be that uh, in our capitalist society, there is a tendency to appropriate and commodify everything right so in a way uh, imagination becomes also a resource to be 
quantified, tapped on, and uh, mobilized uh, yeah. as a capital. Yeah. Um, how much do you see this mechanism going on? I mean, is this something in which big companies are investing, and is this something that we like, or is this something that we find a bit problematic? Yeah, so that's probably going to happen. Um, I, I don't see it happening uh, broadly yet, I guess I would say. Um, but I, I think there's a way in which, so it's, it's, it's going to happen, but I think that if there's a way in which that, you know, the, the capitalism or structure or whatever it is can be in richer conversations with the, with, with imagination, uh, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. And I, I think that there's a way in which, um, like all approaches and practices, it will evolve. Uh, I, I expect it to evolve. Um, in response to just changing conditions, I'm not so much um, like fearful of that. There'll be another thing. I mean, imagination is always changing. What, the, what you know, the the way in which it sort of translates ideas into material form. It, it'll just be constantly evolving, and I don't expect necessarily to uh, that design fiction as we understand it today, or even as I understood it back in 2008, will not also continue to evolve and change and become a different thing, a different name, or whatever it might be. Cool. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. Look, this has been a super nice conversation. And of course, we are not done yet. Uh, but I really feel the need to open it up to uh, our audience, uh, from the students and the guests that are joining us uh, online. Um, I'm, I'm a bit struck by the fact that there seem to be a lot of men in this panel. So I would really love to give priority to some women in uh, uh, in asking questions in case uh, uh, there are uh, some of them. Okay, um, if I can intervene just a second, uh, Gabriele. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a quick a quick comment and then maybe uh, if uh, I'd like to just give a space uh, for Silvio to, to uh, give his very brief reflections on ah. on the topic, what we're talking about, and then we'll jump right right to the question. So, of course. Um, yeah. Uh, here at Domus, we often talk about and we refer to a, re, a visionary approach to de, to design that uh, by necessity touches on the parameters and approaches uh, of uh, futures, uh, speculative, critical design. And of course, we combine that with other design methodologies. Uh, one aspect uh, of this is that um, all, or that's common to all of these is that design is being referred to not as the or the objective design not as the con construction of a final product but more of as an investigation uh, and and i think um for us and as you mentioned in one of your questions gabriele um you know one of the part of the 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 question for us is what is the objective of the, the investigation right um whether it's the context itself or what element of that context which which we, which uh, julian also responded to so i just uh, i just wanted to tie that back a little bit back to for our students as well um because we don't necessarily specifically refer to design futures as an approach but uh or critical design we we let's say we throw these these uh, terms around but we do have a specific approach which is tied and connected um that encompasses some aspects of this so that's maybe a good lead-in for Silvio, if he wants to add anything about uh, futures, um, design fiction, Domus Academy, and then we'll open it up to the questions. Well, basically, we, we started a couple of years ago to introduce these topics uh, and uh, also to explore uh, different uh, ways to combine this kind of approaches uh, with the uh, other uh, more let me say traditional uh, approaches to 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 design and i think that uh, uh, we notice a, an increase an increasing uh, uh, um, uh, interest in this kind of uh, uh, practices uh, uh, approaches uh, and uh, new new ways of uh, 
thinking or and uh, I mean having a, a different mindset in approaching maybe uh, the, the the projects, and uh, I, I think that uh, it it's uh, it's something that could be uh, that should be part of uh, uh, of uh, uh, probably each design curriculum in the, in the way in which we can uh, have. Uh, in a way in which a, a designer can have a different uh, uh, different tools and uh, and methods to uh, face uh, problems uh, and project in it in uh, with a different perspective and i think that uh, and i have also uh, a, a small question also for for julian uh, about the, the the manual and i'm pretty curious to to uh, to know uh, what is i mean the 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 line i mean the, the the idea that is behind the 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 book i mean it's called the manual of uh, uh, design fiction and i'm pretty sure that uh, probably you are not so uh, i mean you are not so on the side of the manuals uh, for, for your practice and uh, the the way you uh, propose some some topics and the approaches that you <clears throat> that you have so my question is, uh, why you should the, the name the manual and uh, which can which can uh, uh, find inside uh, really inside the this uh, this book that we are waiting uh, from a long time. Yeah, that's, that's good. thank you for that. It's a really good question, Julia. So yeah, so the manual of design fiction, right? So there it is. It really exists. Uh, like I mentioned earlier. It's on a truck somewhere in Central Europe heading to our distribution guy in Berlin. Um, and you can find it at the manual of designfiction.com and there's still some left. So the idea of calling it the manual, it was, it was, there was a long heated debate <laughs> in the back room about what the title should be. And um I I personally felt that that uh there was there were a bunch of things that were going on. One thing that I just realized the other day when I was talking to um, Patrick and Chris, who were the editors from uh, No Media Co, who helped us do the book. The I I, w I wanted to like kind of double down on on the, the the design fiction idea. So the manual, doing a man a manual is a in my mind that's a design fiction ar um, archetype. It is a thing. So you could you know we talked about plant based food. We could do as one of those design fictions a uh, a manual a service manual or a setup guide for one of the machines in the factory. I'm just pulling some ideas. So that is the way in which we're gonna represent a little corner of this plant-based food future. Um, or it might be a manual for setting up a display stand in a grocery store, you know, just a little instruction guide, like an Ikea thing. And so the idea of having, the, the manual is an archetype for design fiction. And so the idea of doing the book as an archetype of a design fiction, I, I just enjoyed the like kind of layers of meaning that were going on there. The reason that I, the other reason uh, that I didn't know of until I was having a conversation yesterday was that the the earliest inspiration for me, I mean, inspiration is just like the thing that I reached to was an experience I had when I was, I don't know how old I was, maybe seven or eight or something like that. When I found this Star Trek Starfleet technical manual. And that was, that was a, that was a moment that was like, I can't even describe in words. It was just all feeling. It was just like, whoa, what is this? Like, I, I thought this was just a show on, on, a, on TV. What's going on here that they have a technical manual and look how rich and, and how, how much, how vivid it is showing this other side of the world that I, you don't see at all, you know, mechanical di diagrams. There's a part of it that's essentially like what we would call a brand book. It's got colors, like Starfleet colors, you know, done up and the typography, clear space definitions for, for fonts. And it's just like, it, it made my head explode. And it, the idea of having a manual that describes a world is so powerful because it is a thing from this structure, you know, that we're talking about from the, the client, the client wants the manual, you know, in a way they want the description that is meaningful to them. And to do it in a form that is just pure imagination, 
I find is like the kernel of what design fiction does, or, you know, any kind of way of translating the imagination. There are all kinds of different ways that we do that, right? There's everything from art and music and, uh, um, uh, you know, all kinds of different sorts of um, very specific design practices or ways in which the creative consciousness translates what it dreamed into material form, right? And then on the other side, you have things like uh, the data analytics people, they're translating what they see about the world into this other form that they just kind of, that is a priority is put on it. Like, no, no, that's real. That art stuff, that's not real. What is real is the spreadsheet that the guy made based on, you know, a hundred thousand consumer surveys. And I guess I'm saying like, let's just, let's, let's not prioritize. Let's find all the ways in which we can represent our, our, our ideas, our dreams in these different forms. What design fiction does uniquely is it brings it into a form that seems legible to structure so that the corporate client like understands a manual. They understand an ad advertising campaign. They understand uh, a um, uh, all these other ways in which design fiction is able to represent the world. And so if you can do that in a form that's kind of legible to them, Without, you're, not, you're not trying to fool them and say like, no, this thing is real. You're just trying to say like, does this make a little bit more sense to you? Can you see the world through this magazine that we made for you? This seems like something that is, is representative as opposed to something that they might see as like, oh, this is entirely abstract. I don't know what to do with this. If you went into them and showed them like, a, you know, you, you painted a, you've made a painting of the world, they might be like, that's kind of cool. I'll put that up in the wall, but I, that's not helping me make a decision. You create that form of your imagination, bringing it to structure in a way that they look at and they'd be like, I understand that kind of thing. That's kind of cool. I, we can talk about this now. Well, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> I see. Silvio and Mark uh, uh, smiling and doing a thumbs up. It's been wonderful. Thank you very much. And also to Gabriele for your, your knowledgeable guidance in the conversation. Thanks. Appreciated. Well, see everybody next time in some other future. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.